Hello, comrades. Today we will be continuing reading Johnny Torres' book with Johnny Torres here with us. Um, but as always, we will read the Statement of Beauty first for the Second Rainbow Coalition. Let me start screen sharing. All right, there we go. Hopefully you all can see this. We see it. Right on. Yeah, I see it. All right, I'll begin reading the statement of unity for the Second Rainbow Coalition. The statement of unity for the Second Rainbow... Ooh, sorry. Preface. <laughs> the U.S. was founded as a colonial settler state based upon white supremacy and slavery, Stealing the lands of the indigenous nations, making breaking every treaty made with them, and confining them to quote unquote reservations, concentration camps. As the country became more powerful, the eagle sunk its claws to other nations, making war on Mexico and grabbing its northern territory, invading Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines, and either annexing them outright or turning them into colonies or neo colonies. And in the 20th century, it became the major imperialist power of the world. Robbing, um, um, explore, exploiting both the people within its boundaries and those in every other country, bullying them with military interventions, and robbing them of their right to self determination. As Hugh P. Newton stated, we have two enemies to fight racism and capitalism. Between the two, capitalism is primary, racism is a byproduct of capitalism. The working people of the world, of every the working people of the world of every ethnicity or nationality face a common class, face a common enemy that's destroying life on Earth. Our enemy is a small ruling class of property owners controlling most of the world's wealth and resources. We must have our basic needs met to live a good and meaningful life: food, shelter, health care, education, freedom from the oppression of the state by the state, and peace with other nations. To obtain these essential things for life. We must have the power to see to it that the abundance that is available is shared equitably. Same of beauty for the Second Rainbow Coalition. The legacy of the First Rainbow Coalition dates back to its founding on April 4th, 1969 by the original Black Panther Party, original Young Lords, and Young Patriots Organization. A number of other organizations joined this coalition not too long afterwards, such as the American Indian Movement, Broad Braves, Rise Up Angry, the Red Guards, and others. Since the founding of the United States, the masses had developed a, a popular had developed a number of popular movements that came together to fight back against this capitalist imperialist system in various ways around particular demands. Nevertheless, none have established a movement quite like the First Rainbow Coalition. <clears throat> This historic movement was the first of its kind that established a model of class struggle like no other. <clears throat> its charismatic leader, Chairman Fred Hampton of the, of the Illinois chapter of the original Black Panther Party, stated at the end of the day, we weren't engaged in a quote-unquote race struggle. He said that's a class struggle, goddammit. By uniting with the various oppressed ethnicities and the masses, they are able to bridge the gap, the gap between the various ethnic communities that white supremacy had long sought to keep dividing. This class solidarity equipped them with the, with the, with the material basis and class consciousness to see their common class condition. Therefore, the necessity to form a united front against this, their common class oppressor, the capitalist and peerless ruling class. The ruling class viewed this as the greatest threat to their class rule, and subsequently used the entire oppressive forces of the state, police, courts, jails, prisons, intelligence agencies, etc., in order to crush an emerging revolutionary socialist movement. We refounded the Rainbow Coalition on May 14, 2021, with the intent of upholding the legacy of the original Rainbow Coalition. We believe that this historic example is the model for the United Front that will best serve our class liberation. By upholding the 10-point program of the original Black Panther Party, which was subsequently adopted and later expanded by the original Young Lords, Young Pages Organization, and all other original Rainbow Coalition members, we establish our pragmatic unity. The six disciplinary rules that we uphold ties all organizations in our coalition to a common professional discipline. 
History has bestowed upon our generation a common mission, a common class mission, to fulfill. The representatives of the capitalist imperialist ruling class, represented by the, by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, cannot liberate us. It is their class intention and class interest to uphold our common class condition. Therefore, it is only we, the oppressed masses of all ethnicities and nationalities, who must build the necessary class solidarity, class consciousness, organizational structures, and a united front that will ultimately liberate ourselves. This is what the Second Rainbow Coalition is committed to. This is the historic mission we intend to fulfill. Dare to struggle, dare to win. All members of the coalition, New African Black Panther Party, White Panther Party, Green Party of New Jersey, Poor People's Army, La Mesa Nacional de Brian Berets, Nassau, North Alabama School for Organizers, New Era Young Lords, and American Indian Movement Northeast Woodland Chapter. The six disciplinary rules. Number one, members will conduct themselves in a manner to bring credit to the coalition and will treat others with respect and politeness. Number two, number two members will be sober when on Rainbow Coalition business and will not engage in any criminal activity while a member. Number three, number three, no member will engage in violence except in the extremity of self-defense. Number four, members will not members will not gossip, nor will be divisive to the unity of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Number five, members will not act as informers nor work against the purpose of the Second Rainbow Coalition. And number six, nobody is authorized to speak for the Second Rainbow Coalition unless authorized to do so. And that is the same of unity. Right on. Right on. And with that, we'll begin reading the book. Um, I'm on my phone, so it's going to be pretty uncomfortable for y'all to try and read it. And so um, Shanti or whoever remembers what page we were on, can, can someone screen share the book? I don't have the PDF. <laughs> I'll send you it. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. I do remember where we left off at. I do remember where we left off at. Uh, Let me try getting the PDF. Okay. And I'll, and I'll just send it to my <laughs> mail and open it up. Let me see if I can find it. Um, comrade Yesenia and comrade um, Johnny Torres, do y'all remember where we left off? What page specifically? Thirty-five. Yeah, 85? I wasn't here. I wasn't here for it. So. Oh, you? Oh, you weren't here. I thought you were. Oh yeah, they weren't. I'm trying to find I'm trying to find the PDF for it. It's so weird. Um uh comrade um uh, Johnny Torres, do you have the PDF for the book? Let me try to Okay, uh, I mean, if you can find it, you can send it to my liberation school email. It's I fine. will, don't worry. I'll send it to you. I, oh, wait, no, never mind. This isn't it. There's another one. Da, 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 da. I'm trying to find it, but I don't see where it is. Let me try here. And also, I added more Chicano literature to my book list. 
Oh, right on. That's awesome. I've added some Maya stories. I've added some uh, Maya autobiographies and um, like a history on, you know, so-called Latinos in America. So I've added all of that. Um, I think about 30 books, I think. Look, I don't like Amazon, but one thing about it, they have they have hidden gems. So they do. I'll, I'll give them credit. I'll give them credit for that. And I also added some um, uh, education, uh, educational pedagogy uh, texts. Um, you know, for for the kids, for us. Right on. That's beautiful. <laughs> I can't find that. I don't know why. I thought it was here somewhere. I could have sworn I saw a link to it. Yeah, because, you know, only the moderators can have the full access to the book. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to see where it is. I could have sworn I saw it. Um, Giant Torres, you don't, you don't have the book? I just emailed it to Shanti. Okay, but... right on. Yeah, because for some reason I I don't know it's not opening on my uh my laptop. That's... Oh wait. I don't... <laughs> Yeah, so I just emailed it to you just now. Yeah, it's not in here. Um, Johnny Torres, try sending it in the in the uh try sending it in the in, in the group chat in the in the Zoom chat here. Try sending the link there out and I'll see if I can and and we'll see if we can open it from there. And then I'll save it since you know I have a working tablet. So Oh yeah. I could swear I saw it at some point. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And also to keep time, um, in case y'all don't know, uh, Esperanza, who goes by uh, Proletary Feminist on Instagram, they're threatening to take uh, her page down. And, you know, she's an amazing um, uh, Marxist, Linus Maoist, uh, a Chicano trans woman, uh, amazing, amazing, amazing comrade. So um, just in case the uh, capitalist powers that be take down our comrades page, um, you can add her on uh, Medium and Telegram, which I'll put in the chat. But um, if y'all want more um, principled uh, gems from a Chicano trans comrade, uh, I'll put it in the chat so we can stay in touch with her because. Um, It'll be more secure that way anyway. I mean, come on. So I'm gonna add that uh, for right now as we get this straightened out. Um, okay. Did you get the email, Shanti? Let's see. Got it. Nice, let's go. Gonna add it to my drive. Mm. And I can just thirty five. Okay. Okay. Here. I 
Y'all see this? Debbie! <laughs> Oh my god, I was here the whole fucking time. Jesus Christ. <laughs> hey, Will. Hey, Conrad Will. Um, we just hey. started. We just started the book club, so don't worry, you did not miss anything so far. Hey, Conrad. All right. So, who would like to read first? Yeah. What was that, Comrade Will? I said I can. Okay. Right on. How far am I reading to? Um, these so so there's like an anthology. These poems are very short. They're not long. So each one of us yeah. are gonna take a turn at reading a poem. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> but... So just page just this page. Okay, thank you. All right. <clears throat> All right, so the voices of the revolutionary anthology. At as Talan as line warrior. Oh man, I'm just gonna uh, skip line. Homage to our museum professionals. When the party is over, you are there to vanquish. I don't even know what that word is. Vouchsafe. Vouchsafe us our museums, honoring our sisters and brothers' works of art that. "Quote unquote," undermine imposed models of representation, imposed models of representation like Lydia Mendoza, Sam Cordono, and Xavier Quizada and Pina, Honco Rodriguez, and of late Victor Zambrano. Victor left his paints and printers at the art gallery. Perhaps his last breath allowed him the energy to do so. Our Raza searches for your pin santos, your written journals, sometimes written in a taxi in Mexico at a Mindono and Chorizo fundraiser, maybe after a danza ceremony, writings difficult to find, you are the one that finds humor in our everyday onas, koras, and algeras. Yatambiana, our movement of triumph. This is part of a part of Chicano slash a theater. Rupert. Hmm. Rupert. Uh, Reyes. Oh, that's a name. Rupert Reyes. We salute you for creating our Tetro. When others see our art as non mainstream, you place us on a pedestal, maybe one that you found thrown away, picked up on your way to work. 
who is uh, we know that you continue your museum work, not expecting glory awards, recognition, recognition. You are a true humanitarian who runs through your veins. You are part of the movement La Casa Elsa. Elsa. Um L if you want if you want to read that or not. Yeah you can read that. It just says El Pueblo Unido Jamás Será Vencido. Fin. That's it. Hell yeah. <laughs> I love that quote. Um um oh wait it's not isn't that quote um associated with with President Allende? Or maybe not. I'm not yeah, sure. That was a, but that was I'm a not... cool poem. I really I really like I really liked it. This is him. Who's that? Oh oh there it is. Uh Jesus. Jesus. Cantu. Oh, oh, right, right, right. Jesus um, Cantu Medel. That's a badass fucking name. <laughs> yeah, I know that brother. He lives over here in Houston. Um, yeah, he's really cool people. He knows a lot about, uh, you know, spiritual stuff and, you know, uh, a lot about the ancestors. So he's uh, he's a professor here. And uh, he's uh, he writes several poems but uh, I guess he wrote this, I guess, recent towards the, uh, for the book. So he just like submitted that. But um, yeah, he's, a, he's, a, he's an interesting person. He still uh, teaches and, uh, and whatnot. But uh, I'm just glad that he uh, played a part in this. Right on. Right on. This poem is very beautiful. I really like it. Um, yeah. Andres Mendoza. Uh, would, it, would anyone else like to read that? I can go. Right on. Go ahead, Johnny. Andres Mendoza is a human rights activist, poet, and soon-to-be author. As a result of gang-related shooting when he was 17, he would spend six years incarcerated, discovering his voice through reading and writing. His work is a window into the hard realities of life within marginalized. marginalized communities having lived through systemic. systemic oppression gang warfare and poverty through inside and outside the prison system okay and uh that's his that's photo him. yeah that is him and we're about to read his he wrote two poems for this i believe and uh, it's, called, uh, it's called Immeasurable. I can't measure how pure I am or how I uh, bathe, breathe into existence. The winds of Sanaana guts through brought along sense of my Mexico unknown. El un. un Plateau, Ceramico, surrounded by American strangeness, holding a fork and gripping a spoon, inhaling in the champulados, champulados caloric. caloric fumes, sweetening my soul, only to reveal the sourness a Coke can bring. Kitchingao to have thought my brown pigmentation a punchline to the butt end of a laser man brought back to life on a moment's notice when Tahis was savored through the eyes Tahis brought in the little country store made by and for Americans and yet I am an American walking into a store run by Mexicans, uh, believe the portal to my jefita's home of Guerrero only to, to be turned away 
accused by my own ancient accent of a spy. Chales con queso. Chales con queso. I mean, chales con eso. Tears of free bus rides over yonder, carnal, and fervent, fervent detentions sealed my tongue shut. I can't measure how pure I am, not yet, do I don't think I ever will. Andreas Mendoza. And this is his next poem called Temporary. I was just a little chavito when we left behind the watchtower schools and clothing became interchangeable, yet I remained identical while implementing proper dress codes depending on the writings the tracks posed for. Though every single flashing light ensured the birth of a new pair of Cortezes, Cortezes I'd hope for the same remembrance somewhere at some point, hoping I would forever belong to my name and face frozen on the wall, just like Kings was for our Kings long live long. Yes, live long. Live long. Doubling and the efforts whenever angels watched over, summoned by infinite. infinite prayers to the white Jesus in one of my many living rooms to represent the different places I could never become next to the other placasos displayed everywhere. Blowing the same cigarette smoke as rehearsed many times before staring at the dotted contract on the left hands existing where the same Cortez and O.D. slow cook with the great pretender. Bronze faces covered in dried streaks. streaks remained unseen where my feet took me next to La Bestia, Bestia abandoned and the universal language was spoken e intimately. In intimately under the cover of a bl bl blood red moon, prayers followed by black crows and jade glimmers, wondering how I Tribute. contributed to the ladder. ladder if I had busted busted along a different highway would I never have set foot in stone gardens free Andreas displayed on the blocks playgrounds where little ones neglect their Spanish Spanish and there will be one chavalito trying to decipher the meaning behind those two words like Poesta, Poesia, Poesia, and outnumbered tattoos, admiring what seems an accolade. I'm sorry, Carlito, white knuckles wrapped around the strip be beneath my shower roll as I watched a picture of myself shrouded, shrouded in nothing but a breaking new segment these images spewed only upon those who live in these places i once called temporary that was awesome oh man that, that was pretty deep this is probably like my second time reading that so i have a hard time understanding some poems and what they're about sometimes yeah, this yeah. was really deep and uh, definitely a lot of roots about, you know, uh, his language being stolen, trying to find his voice, uh, but definitely finding it, you know, and definitely discovering who he, who he is and the person he is now. Um, I'm pretty sure I, I ended up talking to him not too long ago and I told him about the book. So here he done got published already. So he's like, uh, 
he's already traveling and you know uh becoming the poet uh he wanted to be so that's good that he actually uh, accomplished that Right. Yeah, that's fucking awesome. I'm glad for him. I'm happy for him. I hope he's doing good. And yeah, you know, that poem is really powerful, you know, trying to find uh your voice when you are when you're a po- when you're part of a colonized group that's constantly having your your culture whitewashed, uprooted, um, discarded and and only being taught that your people were quote unquote savages and they and they have no history and culture and having that internalized hatred, that internalized hatred of yourself and your people and everyone around you, it mu- it's really traumatizing, you know. It is, and especially you know speaking your colonizer's language and still being thrown to the wolves, you know, because you're, you're quote unquote too brown now. You know, this is, you know, especially with Masti Zahid, this is the psychological aspect of it, adopting your colonizer's identity, but even then it's never enough. And it creates a psychological prison within yourself about who you are and even then your bloodline does not change, but it's that psychological warfare that they do, you know, to these people. Are they are they so-called Latino enough? Are they so-called Hispanic enough? You know, are they are they are they Spanish enough? And this is this is one of uh, the psychological aspects of Mesa and Latinidad not being quote unquote Spaniard enough with native people when that culture when um when, when that culture was forced on them to begin with right because that's the whole point <laughs> not, exactly not being quote unquote hispanic enough right um does anyone want want to read this one right here uh, I can read. Sorry, what? I can read, or I can read after. I mean, if you want to go, right on. Um, I'll go after Shanti. Okay, if that's okay. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it. Uh, bio, uh, Captain Lobo, Brown Berets, Oregon, Hillsborough, Oregon. Born Juan Alberto Villalobos, Cordoba Castillo, or John A. Castillo for short, Lobo, as his comrades call him, born to a Mexican mother and a Venezuelan father in El Paso back in the early 70s. His mother's lineage comes from ancestral indigenous Yaqui and Masalero. Apache lines. His fondness of famed uh, Chiricahua Apache warrior, Geronimo, can be found in actions he does like participating in Oregon's first black and brown, brown beret and Panther open carry action against white supremacy. Lobo was one of two co-chairs for La Mesa Nationality Brown Berets in 2021 and is currently the captain of the only active Brown Beret chapter in Oregon, the Oregon Brown Berets, Hillsborough chapter. Lobo looks up to OG revolutionary Brown Beret soldiers like Carlos Montes, Cynthia Barajas, Alfredo Wango, Jorge Lopez, Frank Perez, and many more. Lobo believes in the power of unified black and brown solidarity and helped co-found a new Portland Rainbow Coalition in 2019, along with his Black Rider Revolutionary Part- Party, New Generation Black Panther brother, Mr. Kevin Ogun Dore. As of date, Bobo's chapter slowly grows all over Oregon, spreading militant brown Chicano gospels and revolutionary messages of La Causa. Wow. <laughs> I know Lobo. He's awesome. Oh, you do? Yeah, I know him. Yeah, so do I. 
He's are a cool you, dude. Are y'all friends with him on Facebook or? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I met him in Sacramento. Yeah, I, I think I'm friends with him. I'm not sure, but I think I am. I think. I would love if he could also join these book clubs as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because he's a part of the story. He's a part of the struggle. And we need these people in our presence, especially while they're still here, because they are part of that story. And so it's crucial that they are a part of it. Exactly. And it's a part to learn for, from them so that way we don't make the same mistakes they did. Right. And improve our own strategy and our own practice. And our, with our like, modern day. Exactly. And our, in our, our Sorry, what? Our, revolution, our revolutionary gospels. Exactly. And our current materialistic conditions of the modern day you have to adapt, uh, do better, and be better. Africans and uh, Chicanos alike. Exactly. All right. You got it, Shanti. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I think um, you wanted to turn. Or is that the right? poem? No, no, no. I, I think that that was just the description of Lobo. Yeah, that was his little origin. Now he wrote a small poem too. Yeah, that that wasn't the poem. Oh, okay. So I can read this one, right? Yes. Okay. New age. The day has come where some of us are tired of being tired and will now fight back. Para Raza, we will serve, observe, and protect. We are the new ancestors. They had no fear, and accordingly, we must act. A new age is upon us. Para Revolucion, never will we forget. Lobo. But was that it? Yeah. That was it. Now it's time to read Connie's. I thought it would be longer. <laughs> yeah, so did I, but um, I guess the people don't notice how much they write when it's already published. Like, oh, damn, I wrote that that much or that, that little. Much? Yeah. Like, sometimes I mean, you, you don't I, understand. I gave it back to him like a couple of times to like <laughs> rewrite it, but I guess he was done. I was like, okay. <laughs> Well, right on. I hope he's. I um. I I hope he's doing good right now. Doing good, doing well. Right on. It's on the ground. Okay. Um. Um. Yesenia, do you want to read? Do you want to read this one? Unless you want. Unless you want to read it, Shanti. Uh, I can read. Or I can read. Doesn't matter. Yeah, you can go. You can go. Okay, thank you. Uh, bio, Connie Gonzalez. My name is Connie Gonzalez. I am the spokesperson for San Bernardino County Brown Berets. Brown Berets. I've been a Brown Beret for approximately three and a half years. I became a Brown Beret because I was tired of seeing the injustices happening in my communities and throughout Turtle Island, Semanahuac. Semana the future is extremely important for our younger generation. The first thing that came to mind was, if I don't do this for my children and be the voice for the voiceless, then who will? Not very many will put time aside from their everyday lives to dedicate themselves to fight for the struggles and injustices that our people face daily. This crooked system was created to purposely set us up for failure. The enemy from day one have come to our lands to forcibly take what was never theirs. Therefore, they continued to take from us and have tried to not allow us to succeed and flourish. Yet here we are continuing to fight, to resist. La lucha sigue. Thanks to my mentors I've had the pleasure of working with and whom I have the utmost of respect, Carlos Montes, Gloria Ariane, Arianes, Cynthia Barajas, and Jorge Lopez, all original Brambrays throughout Aslan. 
It's because of my ancestors, my grandfathers, my grandmothers, my heroes, Corky Gonzalez, Reyes Lopez, Tijerina, Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, and Jeronimo, just to name a few, is why I am passionate and extremely loyal to my people and this movement. Most of all, the love for my children, which is why I hope to leave a legacy behind for them and learn that women are the backbone of all movements, and without us, there is no revolution. No revolucion. Viva la causa. Connie Gonzalez, spokesperson. San Bernardino, County Brambores. That was beautiful. Hell yeah. 100%. Like yeah, you said, she's a with powerful brown beret right there, Connie. A bad ass. A bad oh, yeah. ass as fuck. Yeah, that's a bad fourth ass. Um, She wrote a poem too, but this, this picture right here and her... Uh, yeah, she's uh, still a brown beret over there. She's a danzante too. And I, I told her about the book idea. She she loved to be a part of it. So not only is she part of this anthology, but she'll she's part of the second one as well. Ooh. A so she wrote, yeah, she wrote something just as powerful on the other one. So I cannot, I cannot wait. wait. I cannot wait. Exactly. I cannot wait. <laughs> and exactly as, as you said, without without women in the struggle, there is no revolution. African women, include, African exactly. women, Ghana women, uh, Boricua women, uh, Vietnamese women, Palestinian women, like, they are the backbone. They are the foundation, you know, and we should up with them and us, us and them. Because we are that push forward. Exactly. The third, like the, mouse. Third, the third world women's struggles. I mean, you've seen it in the third world women's struggles of the of the sixties, of the seventies, of the eighties, of the nineties, especially uh, including Kurdish, including uh, Kurdish, uh, Kurdish, uh, Kurd women. Uh, in, in, in Kurdistan, like they are the driving force of it all. Exactly. No. Like Mao said, women hold up, hold up half the sky. Eh? They hold up half the damn sky, if not more. Yep. Right on. And we have to incorporate everyone who's oppressed under this yep. capitalist imp imp imperialist system. It's not just economic. It's social. It's, it's social. cultural. It's political. Political, political. Like you can't it, just ignore, it, you can't just ignore the secondary. You can't ignore, you can't ignore capitalism without ignoring racism, misogyny, ableism, queerphobia, fatphobia. It's all interconnected. It's all economic, social, and rooted within this class society, within the right. socioeconomic base of the system. The socio the socioeconomic base shapes the superstructure and. Sh and um and maintains it while uh, while the superstructure if i remember correctly maintains and shapes the social economic system and it's, uh, it's interconnected it's they affect all, one another they affect one another and especially in aslan and uh aslan slash Shamanahuac, since it's all since it's all on the same land um you see those contradictions a lot, especially in regards to um, sexual violence against uh, Chicana women, against uh, Chicana trans women on the so-called Mexican side, because Mexico is a settler state too. Um, yep. You know, you see those contradictions play out a lot on the on the Mexican side, and so. It's very important, especially for um, all Chicanos to um, confront all of those class contradictions and all types of class warfare, especially against the most um, oppressed within, uh, within the Chicano people. And, you know, once again, you see those dynamics play out in real time. And it's very, very important that 
um, not only uh, Shadonals, but African people too, uh, confront those contradictions because once again, women and other gender expansive people hold up half the sky in our livelihood and in the struggle. And we always have. And right on. we don't confront it. When we don't confront those contradictions, when we don't confront the warfare that has been placed amongst our peoples, we perish. For what? And for what? People ha- have to have to engage in class suicide. Right. I want, they have to like, betray. Check on, check on um, men. Uh, give exactly. up of their class privilege. You know, their machismo. The machismo, like it needs to go, so they can come back to reality and struggle with the people, and not just what the class system has psychologically made them. Uh, to be, you know, and it's very, very important. It's very, very important because, you know, once again, especially with a uh, transmissia, which is uh, hatred against any kind of gender fluidity, any kind of transness, um, you know, there is, there are gender conforming people that engage in transmissia against other gender conforming people. It's, it's a torture condition. And it plays out, especially um, in African communities, in uh, uh, Chicano communities, and you know it's you know it's now reached fever pitch, especially this year. So once again, if we don't confront it, if we don't start educating each other, and stop being in separate factions and thinking that being separate and isolated from other people is going to fix the problem, no, it's not because what it's going to do is make you more bitter and it's going to cause even more reactionary mess that we don't need right now or ever, you know? And it's important that we confront it together because if we don't confront it together, what are we struggling for? Exactly. And we need to incorporate those other marginalized oppressed groups within our struggle. We need to listen and struggle alongside trans people, women, um, disabled people, fat people, and so on and so forth, because they're the ones who are being oppressed by right. different kinds of class antagonisms. They know it the best because they have experienced it. Poor women, homeless women, lumpen women, like lumpen African women, lumpen Chicano women, lumpen uh, Bori- Chinese women, so on and so forth, lumpen Boricua, Bor- Boricua women. Right. And we will confront it together. I don't care about all the contradictions of capitalism through cultural revolution, free a new culture. And I don't I don't care what some some um, uh, uh, some opponents say. I don't care because separating yourself. Is not going to help. Your struggle, our struggle. Because once again, it's going to be more bitterness that's going to be built up and it's going to be running from the problem. And we don't want to keep running from the problem no more. We've already done that um, for a long time, but that time ends now. Now we have to really confront ourselves and each other and really talk and educate each other, agitate each other and talk to each other. Because if there's no talking, there's dissent. And when there's dissent, there's chaos. And we don't want that no more. We don't want that no more. Right on. And it's reductionist. Yep. It's reductionist as well, not incorporating these different struggles, these, these different types of oppression that all exist under capitalism. Because if one is left to fester in the minds of the people, then the bourgeois would just, would just use that to infiltrate and 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 cause dissent and cause and cause confusion within within the movement it's e- it's easier to engage in revisionism when the people still have reactionary sentiments left behind by capitalism 
because, it, because they'll fall easier in line with, with, uh, with bourgeois thought than if we engage in criticism, self-criticism, and cultural revolution to uproot said thoughts, said sentiments. Exactly. Right on. Um, is this the next poem? I think it's still part of hers. Oh, it it's is? Still part of it. it is. Oh, I didn't realize. <laughs> Sorry. Um, our struggle. Nuestra lucha. They came, they lied, they took. Our cultura, our religion, our names were ripped from our hearts and our souls, trying to shadow our existence with their swords and diseases. 1325. Huitzilopochtli dijo Mexicatiawi, la águila y serpiente nos señaló nuestra, nuestra tierra prometida. Our gold, our silver, minerals, and spices they seeked and desired. The cynicism of their intrusion and invasion of our way del Teocali, Tenochtitlan. Uninvited, they overstayed their welcome. We did not need your foreign and civilized way of life, your laws that were never meant for us. Nonetheless, your religion that massacred our ancestors and still to this day over 500 years of pain and suffering continues. Pero no más, ya basta. Our sacred, sacred temples remain. Our semillas remain and those you will never vanish. Resisting, surviving, and still rising, we shall never cease to exist. Connie Gonzalez, San Bernardino, California. Um, I'm going to read this one unless someone else wants to read it. Oh, I see house music in this. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You already tried to? <laughs> My city is getting their shine, too. <laughs> uh, I can read this. I can read right this. Right on. Go uh, ahead. I, I know you're going to love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Bio uh, Danetta Copeland, a.k.a. D3. Born and bred in Leeds, Danetta Copeland, a.k.a. D3, is recognized by her lyrical styles and rhyme in her storytelling. Writing and performing her own style of rap poetry, as well as other genres such as house, jungle, and drum and bass. Oh, hell yeah. A former poet coach for Leeds Young Authors, a writing workshop group, she accompanied teams to the Brave New Voices Annual Poetry Slam, a spoken word competition in LA in San Francisco, 2005-2010, where she fine-tuned her lyrical skills. The Netta promoted promotes positive values, although her lyrics and delivery are rather cutthroat. Supports and performs for Mothers Against Violence, Amnesty International, Women's Rights and Love Music Hate Racism. She is currently working on her album, Product of Society, and is one of the vocalists in a high-energy drum and bass band, Hayashi. A badass. He's awesome as fuck. I can tell. <laughs> I think, yeah, this is one of her works. So I'll read this. Social media. I am infiltrating every aspect of your life. Find me always waiting to collect all your insights. Without hesitating, you share and share alike. So tell me where you are and what you have for tea tonight. Observing all you view and all you do to my delight. So greedy, always needing to feed my appetite. My bites are mega, never screening. I'm a socialite. No need for mayhem. I know what you're saying and I copyright. Tell me what you're talking about. Here's your chance to shout it out. 
wonder how you lived without posting enormous amounts. I am the pandemic infecting the world throughout. This is a systemic plan. I am paramount. I never really had a doubt that you would make my day. Express yourself on all accounts for me to give away. Taking identities and everybody wants to play. So tell me what you're talking about so it can be displayed. The revolution won't be televised. There's no encyclopedia. Mainstream news is compromised. So nothing will be clear to you. All that you see advertised, no sense of academia. The only place is authorized is here on social media. D3. <laughs> that was awesome. I love that rap. It was nice, short, and straight, and straight to the point. D. That's this, right. This, this, this was this, again. This is me. This is me. <laughs> this was again. Okay. These social media. These, these social media. Um, these social um, media um, apps and websites. That that's what they do. They encourage you to show every single every single little facet of your life, so, so that way they can send and and give your information to third parties. So that way, so that way they can send you advertisement that um, that you will be more fond of. So that, so that way they can maximize profit and make you okay. buy more stuff and more and more and more and more. It's all the same. Docile. Docile. Not only that, not only that, but it's funny. It's funny because it's funny because if you remember, if you remember, y'all remember, y'all remember when that whole fucking TikTok thing. Was happening when the U.S. said they were going to fucking ban TikTok for, for, from here. Even though we hate TikTok with the death of us. Yep. I found it funny that they were banning TikTok because they said that TikTok sent information to companies for their own profit. Doesn't Facebook do the same? Does it Instagram is it, do the same? The same is it owned by a European American? Like, is is that not the same thing? And this is this is the same thing that we're talking about. As much as we hate TikTok, which I'm pretty sure we all do because it's it's hell on earth, they don't care about whatever reason. The fact of the matter is, regardless, TikTok was started by Chinese people. That's and why they, they cared. That's why they, they want to get rid of it. They only use that Chinese founder as a scapegoat for xenophobia against Chinese people regardless and against China, because even though China is a social imperialist uh, faction today, they don't care because they want to put all Chinese people in it. And this is how xenophobia plays out because they don't care about a Chinese person's um, social economic class status. They don't care because they'll find whatever reason, whatever reason to suppress Chinese people, to suppress uh, the Chinese people in diaspora and um, suppress other oppressed uh, peoples, regardless if they come from a, a country that is currently a social imperialist um, state. They don't care about that. They don't care don't about care. that. They only care about the fact that they can use their identity alone separate from everything else as, as scapegoats for um, oppression and capitalist imperialism. And that is what they do. That is what they do. And especially with um, Tank Talk, you know, like you Being see- so popular. Lot, you see a lot of misinfo, music losing its value because once again, maximizing profit by any means and suppressing rev actual revolutionaries on that app um, poisoning uh, children with this capitalist crap that they push on that app every single day. Um, you know, giving neo-Nazis and other reactionaries a platform, but real revolutionaries the boot. You know, and this is this is how social media works. YouTube, uh, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or X, or whatever the fuck it is now. Um, that's what they do. That is what they do, and they have nothing to lose because, once again, it's it. These are capitalist factions that we're talking about, and especially against African people, they they suppress us heavily all the time, all the time. You've seen it. Um, you've seen it with the with the uprisings three years ago. 
you've seen it uh, with any other uh, uh, police genociding um, against one of our peoples, uh, you see that all the time. And once again, this is a prime example of social media going into your life to make you not only a spectacle, but to also maximize their own profit. You know what I'm saying? And this is this is how it plays out. Exactly. That's how they do it. Because because the US never give a fuck about quote unquote um private information being shared. The US does it all the time. They do it right now. They never they cared about it. The, the only thing that matters to them is that they had a competitor. That that's what matters. They had they had they had a foreign capitalist um company competing them and winning against popular U, 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 U.S. companies and apps. So they need a way to to um to get okay. rid of competition because once again, it does not matter how much these capitalist pieces of shit want to portray it. Capitalism hates competition. It hates. Ca- Competition because the more people that that compete, the less um the, the less access capitalists have to resources. That's why they monopolize. They and monopolize it, businesses so that way they're the only ones who have access to an entire industry to, to have all its resources to pri- right. to to ha- to have private ownership of it to commodify every commod- single as facet of that of that industry and those resources. So when they those- saw a foreign uh, a foreign company. Being able to outcompete um, 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 social media like YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, or as it's called now, oh, X. Fuck, fuck Elon Musk. <laughs> the, yeah, fuck. Um, the U, the the U.S. said, "Okay, we have to deal with uh, we have to deal with TikTok outcompeting the, the, these companies." So they lied. These uh, as a scapegoat. They lied, and what? And once again, what do they do when cap when they're under threat? fascism, imperialism, political repression, political yep. suppression, they, because they are in decay. They are in decay, especially as we speak with um, Palestine. And once again, they result to full-blown imperialism when they're in decay because they're fading away. So they have to literally commit mass, mass extermination of whole families and uh, entire breeds of children and women um, in uh, third world, fourth world, global south um, countries to keep itself up because they are in decay. That's the thing. They are in decay. The uh, American capitalism is in decay. Canadian uh, capitalism is in decay. Um, Mexican and uh, Mexican um, capitalism is in decay. Um, Boricua capitalism is in decay, but because they are comprador factions, they are comprador factions, especially yep. in the, in the global south. And you know, once again, you know the um, the uh, Mexican settler state once again committing violence against. Um, indigenous communities and kicking them out on their own land. They're aiding in the two. They're not innocent either because they have used propaganda against native people uh, to make uh, Mexico what it is. And once again, this is how this is how they play out because they're in decay. And so once mm-hmm. again, have nothing, they have nothing to lose. They literally have nothing to lose. And so once again, this is why it's very, very important that we don't lose ourselves in this uh, social media world because we're in, the, we're in the final stage of capitalism. So how it ends is do we perish or do we fight back to make a new world where they don't exist, you know? So right on. That's what we have to keep in mind here. Right on. That's what we have to keep in mind. It's either we struggle and we win, 
or we don't struggle and we and we become extinct. It's a matter of life or death. Right. Um, also, um, for everyone, Comrade Will, uh, Johnny Torres, Yesenia, what, what are y'all's opinion um, or um, or thoughts on the chapter that we just read? I would love to hear what y'all, um, or the poem, rather. I would love to hear what, what some of y'all are thinking. I want to hear it, too. Comrade Johnny, you there? Yes. I'm here. I think, uh, and we we are, we are talking about Connie's, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, it was something powerful. She definitely uh, dug deep in her her roots, and she brought them uh, to life. Um, uh, I've been knowing her for a good amount of time as a brown beret, and she definitely um, always has boots in the ground and. Uh, she rarely uh, writes poetry, but she had like, I guess, like two poems. So I guess she gave one for this book, one for this book and one for the next one. But um, yeah, they were powerful. Um, she definitely knows a lot about her, uh, you know, uh, her history, revolutionary history, um, ancestral history. So she's really, she definitely uh, bought it all to the, uh, to the, the anthology, but I definitely uh, believe this was one of the the best ones uh, for sure. Uh, the the bio she wrote an interesting bio, and she wrote a really uh, good poem as well. Right on. <clears throat> and the fact, the fact that that's house too. I feel seen. Uh -oh. <laughs> I just wanted to add right on, on to like a point that was made earlier. I think it was like, um, Shantia said this, it was like, all the capitalisms are dying, like American capitalism, Canadian capitalism, next Y and Z. And like, I feel like the funny part is, cause like I'm taking this class and they were talking about how like, um, how like George Washington, right? Like all his teeth were made from like enslaved black people. Like that's where he got all his teeth from. So like mm -hmm. when I, it made me think like capitalism's always been decaying, like since its inception. But it's like every single time one body part comes off, it's like they steal it from a different part of the globe. And then it's like now people are just like, damn, like we want our body parts back. You feel me? Right. Oh, yeah. Well, 100%. That's what I capitalism does. It's always been decay. It always, it always has to uphold itself. If capitalism can't uphold itself by tricking people that it's a quote unquote democracy, then it just goes straight up to fascism and, and upholds itself by force. And that, that's exactly what they do because capitalism is designed to fail. Yep. It's never been designed to be sustained in any way, shape, or form. Okay. It it cannot it it cannot it, um it can, it, oh. can, it cannot hold up on on itself. Capitalism always relies the exploitation and oppression of other countries, of of other, of, of other resources or, and of other labor just to survive. Capitalism other, requires Capitalism, capitalism re re requires um, an infinite amount of resources on a finite planet with finite resources and a finite existence. There is no right. such thing as, as an end to capitalism. It always needs more. There's no, there's no such thing as, as, as enough. It would never succeed. It destroys it was, everything in its path. Right. It, that's what they do. Capitalism, once again, is doomed to fail. And that's the entire point because it cannot sustain itself. So what happens when they don't sustain itself? Once again, fascism, imperialism, suppression of the masses, that's what they rely on. And with George Washington, I mean, that's not even a secret. That's not even a secret. Now there's more people that are knowing that because once again, this is, this is our enslaved ancestors that we're talking about. These are our ancestors that were kidnapped from their homeland, our homeland from across the pond and taken here to replace the labor of another indigenous people. And the fact that they've used our teeth, our teeth to even satisfy Washington's needs, you know, that shows you that they have nothing to lose. They will racialize us, they will gender us, to death 
in order to give whatever resources they can out of us. I mean, you see it with um, the cobalt uh, and chocolate uh, exploitation against our indigenous African kin back home. Um, you see it uh, with the exploitation of the resources for uh, uh, chocolate with the Chicanos here as well. Um, stealing resources from indigenous uh, nations here on this continent. And it's very, very, very crucial, very, 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 very crucial that we study this enemy that we're up against because it's very, very easy to fall for it. They're very, very sophisticated. Once again, they have nothing to lose. So they are very, very sophisticated, um, especially as we've seen in Palestine's um, fight towards liberation and Israel is not real suppression against the Palestinian people, wiping out whole families because they have nothing to lose. As long as there is a larger imperialist power backing smaller imperialist powers, then they will continue. As long as we continue to put our numbers and decimals and faith into our oppressor, this will continue and we will pay the price for it. So once again, capitalism is doomed to fail. It's not meant to last beyond 530 years. Okay, that's the exactly. truth. And how it ends, once again, is either extinction or a communist world. That's it. There's no, it. There's no in between. There's no metal ground with this. There's no metal ground with this. And we know this. We know this. We've been knew it for 55 whole years when Cold Pro first came out, when Reagan became president, when Nixon became president, when Clinton, Bush Jr. and Sr., Obama, and now Biden. We've seen it. And now it's that time to put the power back in our hands and control our livelihood because it's either, it's either become extinct or either either become extinct or make a red world our choice exactly that that that's what's going to take because even though capitalism cannot stand on its own it can't be it can't replace itself that requires the masses that requires the oppressed people to replace and start a new world because once again the oppre- the oppressor cannot live without the oppressed, but the oppressed can live without the oppressor. We don't need them. We have everything we need to survive and live a good and decent life. We don't need we, we don't need these capitals. We don't need Jeff Bezos. We don't need that. Elon Musk. We, we don't never, need any of them. Operated that way. Our uh, indigenous Africans never operated that way. We always had decentralized, non-hierarchical community structures. That is the people and the land. The people and the land, the Ibos, the Arubas, our ancestral peoples. And once again, all these jails, all these prisons, all these um, police factions suppressing, especially the Ibo people, the Biafra nation, that was introduced by England, Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, Italy. That was introduced to us. So that shows you that it can never ever sustain itself anyway, because it's all about demonizing indigeneity and demonizing the people and the land, stealing our resources that have kept us self-sustaining even under a feudalist system, even under a capitalist uh, system, because this was at the very beginning of modern capitalism. So it shows you that we didn't need to extract resources in an oppressive way to begin with, because that was never how we operated. These are foreign to us. Capitalism is foreign to us. It's not indigenous to us to begin with. And that's the point. Exactly, exactly. Um, comrade Yesenia, what do you what, what do you gotta say about this um this um this poem that we just read? 
Um, so I just wanted to say that it's crazy how times have changed and how this poem definitely depicts that, how we are so tied to our phones, to social media, to posting, to the newest app, the fastest app, you know, less ads, shorter ads, um, and how everything is tracked and recorded and how it can be brought back and how it can even be taken to court, to court. Like, no, this is what you said. This is what, where you stand. And are you going to do a public apology or like, you know, all of this stuff. So in one hand, it's a good thing to be able to connect and record and document. But on the other hand, it's still controlled. How many times have people gone to Facebook jail or their contact has been, content has been deleted um, or reported because it's speaking on the truth. Right. So it's just, you know, they, as long as we're not dependent on one single source of anything um, and are still able to go back to the old school ways to connect with one another on a personal level, um, in person, on ground level, you know, over food, sharing food, uh, community building, community right. work, educating, community education and empowerment, um, then we can still overcome. And as long as you can relate to one another on the struggles um, and how you can both work together using each other's uh, strengths, you know, we can all rise up. But if we focus on being divided on, um, you know, and isolated, divided and isolated and, you know, divided by whatever gender, race, class, um, whatever expression, shoot, even whatever team you support or what side of town you live on, like different people in different communities have different realities. And even if you're in the same kind of category, say, um, you know, another Chicana, I may not be able to relate to her because she's on a different, uh, I guess, still in the system level. And I'm not, and I claim more my indigeneity. And it took a lot, a long time, a long time to be able to get to this spot. Um, right. But even then, if I go to Mexico, I'm not Mexican enough. I'm too American. Um, so it's always that in between wherever I go. So, but at the end of the day, I'm still indigenous. I'm still native. My right. family's from this land. We're from this land. The border changed. They redrew them. They try to redraw the map. But our names tell a story. Our history tells a story. Our, and as long as we remember, you know, we can overcome and we can learn. And it's interesting how capitalism comes about because like just if you look a lot of people get stuck in a short amount of time of I guess human existence um, but if we look over human existence throughout thousands and thousands of years hundreds of thousands of years you know um, we didn't need money right. pretty much all in survival mode and we complicated our life by trying to make it easier and more convenient. Um, and we got brainwashed into thinking that you need a full-time job in order to survive, in order to be successful, in order to live a happy life, in order so you can retire to do the things you want and have time to paint or relax or go to the mountains or fish or whatever. Um, if you make it that far, right? So, but first we're going to try and kill you and exploit you and um, yeah. extinguish your flame so we can still make a buck. And even after you die, we're going to charge your family an arm and a leg. Right. So right. it's all a fucked system. And until everybody wakes up and realizes that it's just an uphill battle. It's just like going it's upstream all the time. But yeah. if we keep getting these, these educational... Uh, lessons uh, and classes and discussions and these books keep coming out then you know there's a record and you're inspiring people to wake up it's like oh wait I never learned about this they never taught me about this taught me this in school yeah. um, and like the less dependent we are on those systems the better we are like our mental health should always be first but we're always put uh, 
with our backs against the wall, like, do I take care of my mental health or do I take time off of work? How much is it going to cost me? Um, do they even take my insurance? I don't have insurance. Like, and then when you'll be seen. So we always value profit over people's health. And everywhere I've worked, it's almost been the same, especially with uh, people's in positions of power. Right. Uh, and it's just... I feel like a lot of people, once they get promoted, they, they lose that connection. Um, and it's more for the system, for the company. Um, because at the end of the day, we're all in survival and we're fighting for scraps to make sure that we have a job that our families are taking care of. So it's, it's like just another layer upon another layer upon another layer. But eventually everything is going to fall apart. I mean the game Monopoly sh is showing us and teaching us how capitalism works and it's not a fair game. Right. And and exactly. I wanna make, and I wanna make one thing clear. Health under capitalism does not exist. There's no such thing as health under capitalism. No such thing. Mm -hmm. It's healthcare, it's health business. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's they, what it is. It's because they rely on our bodies, on the class warfare against our bodies, against fat people, uh, the prototypical uh, perfect thin person, the perfect worker, you know, as means of class warfare against us. And you know, there's there's a really really good book um, by. Uh, a disabled uh, person who has a podcast called uh, Death Panel, an amazing, amazing podcast. I think it's on SoundCloud. That's where their episodes are. And it's called Health Communism. And I think that's essentially self-explanatory. It means all care for all people to each need, to each one, to each one's needs and each one's abilities. And once again, Health does not exist under capitalism. It's it's a imaginary thing because they don't care about health. They don't care how ill you are. Um, poisoning our resources, poisoning our food, um, poisoning our drinks, and making us so sick. Uh, um, and even the even the medicine. That they give us and, and the treatments, it's not a, it's not designed to actually tackle the core it problem. Matter. It only it only it only it only it only fixes the symptoms of the disease, but never the actual disease it, it, itself. Because if they if they can if they only target the symptoms and not the disease, then the symptoms will, will just come back and then you, you you're forced to go there again, give up give up your money and so on and so forth. They have to make you a repeating um, customer. Essentially, to constantly make you go going back there because medicine is being reduced and reduced and, and, and reduced, being cut back using using cheaper and more affordable ma materials to maximize profit that that aren't as effective. Right, and especially with these the, uh, with decongestants, they already proven that that doesn't work because our livelihood is not in our hands. We already had medicine, but mind you, this was. This is predating before we were introduced to all the European uh, diseases that almost killed every single one of us off. So, but we have medicine. We already have powerful medicine. It came from the ground, from our soil, from the earth. From the earth. We're an earth people. We every single people. medicine, every single medicine that, every single medicine and every single, um, pharmaceutical treatment at some point in time came from a plant or a herb in, in the earth. Right. I mean, we had the coca plant before they before the capitalists turned it into cocaine. We had poppy seeds until they turned it into heroin, I think, because I think they mentioned it in the Young Lord's book. Like, I think poppy, I think poppy seeds, if I remember correctly, I think poppy seeds is um is um opioid opioid. I yeah. think that's what poppy seeds are. Yeah, heroin is a chemical, a chemical opioid, a chemical yep. one. And once again, using our indigenous ecology, 
to kill us. They gave native people alcohol. They gave them freaking, uh, they gave uh, enslaved indigenous Africans cocaine. They gave us heroin. They gave us um, all these uh, fentanyl. They gave uh, poor European Americans fentanyl. Like it's literally a, a genocidal cycle. And once again, this is why we need to have our livelihood back in our hands because we control the means of our livelihood. And once again, we cannot think that working ourselves to the bone only to get just a little freedom, to get a little bit of livelihood is okay because it's not. It doesn't matter how how much you run from it. It doesn't it doesn't matter how many excuses you make. You know it's not okay. You're killing yourself. Yeah, it's interesting because um, my family they started off as farm workers, and now my yeah. mom she works at a meat packing plant. Um on the knife so she's cuts it, cutting up all the meat and everything but she's been doing that for over 30 years and it's it's destroying her body and they treat them like crap definitely exploitation um a lot of high power hierarchy like just degrading and my mom she doesn't like herself but for her she's like this is i moved up you know nothing's going to pay me as much as they pay me here and I have nowhere else to go that like she can only do manual labor. Right. She can't be out in the field anymore. And so this is this is progress when you come from nothing. So right. it's hard to try to see people how they could be doing so much better. There's so much more than this. What than this, but this is all they've ever known and this is this is success. Right. Um so it's it's a challenge, um, but it also keeps us uh, divided just because then they're like, oh, no, I don't want to lose what I have. The individualism. That mm -hmm. we exactly. That's what capitalism makes us, individualistic. Because under a capitalist system, it's either you give up your labor to survive or you die. And it forces us to be individualistic. It forces us to think in an individualistic way that the only person that matters is you and you alone. That right. that that it's okay to backstab everyone around you if it means you 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 can get more 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 privilege in life. That's what capitalism causes. That's, That's the social relations that cause it, it, alien, it alienates us from our from our labor. It, it alienates us from from the um the um the resources and materials we pour our labor into, and especially of all, it alienates us from each other. It turns us, for, for, it turns us from being interconnected to being individualistic and barely knowing one another because of the who relation we, of production. Who we are, who we are, we have been so brainwashed. We're sick, we're sick, mentally, psychologically, and physically, we're sick, we're sick. We don't know what reality is. Working nonstop for 30 years. That's not that's not living. That We're alive but not living. That there's no that you feel that there's no other option, that there's no way out. It's a prison. It's a prison. It's that's why we say it's a prison within a prison, because that's what it is. You work to death. And your mind is so depleted and so detached from itself that you don't know what the hell is going on anymore. You don't know yourself anymore. You don't know yourself anymore. And the individualism and looking down on poor and homeless people because we moved up the social ladder, that is not success. I am so so sorry, but that is not success. If if you if you 
if you're killing yourself in the name of success, then you're literally lying to yourself because you're, we're sick. We're traumatized. And this is what we have to deal with for 531 years since it's 531 years since Columbus came to Abiyala to the islands. This is what we've been dealing with. And we think that there's no other way out, that there's no real place for us, that there's no way out. And what do we do? We work ourselves to death. We uh, get on these vials of poison that the capitalists give us and put in our communities uh, to not deal with it. And you see the result of that. We keep running. We're running and running and running from the problem in our own bodies, thinking that we've made progress and we've not, we have not, we have not. And it's now a matter of how do we convince these people that a new world is possible, that there is indeed a way out. How do we meet them where they psychologically are at? Because they have been so depleted for so long, they don't even know what the hell is going on anymore. They don't even know themselves. So how is, is once again, how do we meet them where they are at to liberate their minds, to liberate their spirits, to liberate their bodies, to get them back on track again, to get them back in tune with their land again? How do we go forward with that? I think we need to like target the next generation. So like their kids or grandkids. Um, because by now, like for me, I've tried to um, educate also, my I mom thought... and Sorry. support her and, and, you know, let her know. Cause she doesn't want, she doesn't like claiming her indigenous, indigenous side. She just says she's Mexican. I'm like, where are we from? Where do we come from? Where have we always been? The land. And that's why exactly. we have certain focus. Uh, she's a lighter shade. Um, so she, she's light skin. And so me and my grandma were the darker ones. But you can see it in her families. We're clearly clearly native. Um, but because of how they grew up, you they had to detach from that, especially with Catholicism um, and trying to move up in society. Right. So the further you distance yourself, um, the better off you are the more educated you seem to be perceived um the more opportunities and that goes for any communities of color um right there's a lot of color, color that we have um but until she sees that it affects her kids or her grandkids and that they can have better if they all stick together then you know she's not going to do it she's not going to want to like give up what she has or risk losing her job, um, if she has people to feed, if she has people to take care of, or if um, it's going to harm the family unit. It's going to harm it. And this is this is the poison that we have been dealing with for, for, for a few centuries now. Success mm -hmm. came of what? Being beaten by priests because you're speaking Spanish? In the name of what? Mm -hmm. And then what? Going to residential schools and being stripped of who you are and being buried under said site? Success at what cost? Working yourself to death for 30 whole years, not knowing where your ancestors come from, not knowing who you are? Success in the name of what? Mm -hmm. And it isn't until everybody gets together and is on the same page, because when it's just one person or just one unit, like they'll get taken under and then they'll be left in there, the wind. There and cannot so, be one person. No. Everybody has to come together and that's why it's so important to have those connections and be able to see how we all relate and how we can all stick together. Like if everyone stopped buying iPhones, would they drop the price? Right. Well will will the system collapse? Yeah, they, because they, they, because, because mm -hmm. they rely on they rely on the exploitation and genocide of my peoples in the uh, Congo and Goa Basin, our ancestral peoples, mm -hmm. you know, explaining them, our cobalt, our cobalt, our resources, our livelihood that we knew mm -hmm. how to use before um, the Germans came, before the French came, before um, the, 
the Belgians came, before King Leopold came. We knew how to work with our resources and they are exploiting our ancestral peoples back home for cobalt, for these iPhones. Yep. And we know that this is going on. And just like the maquiladoras at the border, they put up all these yeah. factories to exploit that cheap labor to manipulate and sexually harass and assault the women because they have bigger bottoms so they could sit for longer, smaller hands, so they could work the small tech pieces and put everything together and easily manipulate that's- and throw fear into it. And then they that's- dip out and leave and go to China or wherever, and then they leave all the toxic waste behind. And they don't get anything, maybe a slap on the wrist, if anything, but all of that gets is still there. They can't use it's, the water, they can't use the land. It's they still have there. To migrate, they have to move. Yeah. And they separated about 50 uh, Chicano native groups uh, with that damn border. Yeah. That doesn't, it, it only exists under a capitalist system, it only exists under imperialism. Because once again, they want to make it seem like there's less indigenous people on this continent than there actually mm-hmm. are. There are yeah. way more, way more. They're just in, they're just psychologically Spaniard. They're psychologically European. And, you know. Oh, they say they're Mexican or Mexican-American. But where are we from? Yeah. Where like, so, from? What are our roots? What are our lands? What, are our, what does our genetics say? Right. Assimilation does yeah. not mind. It is not changing your it's book. Not watching. And it starts at a young age. Like I was forced to learn English. I'm an ESL kid. And yeah. then people are surprised because I can speak both languages. And it's like I, I had no choice. And when I asked for a higher pay, they're like, look at me all funny. I was like, well, that's included. Well, if I'm translating for a doctor or whatever, like y'all should compensate the more because that's I'm saving y'all some money. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I mean people and ah. skills yeah. and like it's not and if I'm translating for HR which I've done before like hey shouldn't you if you know the work communities are working in shouldn't you be able to communicate yep. with the communities with the people you're with your employees but no no I get no I guess we're too brown to speak Spanish now to so trans- and then it, in the Spanish communities if you don't speak Spanish then you're not Mexican enough or whatever. Then if you're indigenous or trying to speak Nahua and you don't know enough, then you're not indigenous enough. It's just like, it's a never ending system. Oh. And until people break through and free from that, then that's when we're going to make progress and move forward and make a difference. And we will make for, and we will make headway with, um, the, with uh, the Zoomer youth and the alpha children uh, coming up. You know, we, we, we need to, really break that cycle with us with with our generations once and for all because this cannot keep happening to us it cannot keep happening to us if you know if most people of other generations you know can't do it then it's our responsibility to break that cycle with us and that's why i'm making a liberation school once again because i'm sick and tired of this cycle playing out repeatedly. I'm sick and tired of children and youth, colonized children and youth, us being demonized and being uh, exploited and being abused and being discarded and being treated like cattle, like we're nothing and that we have nothing and we have nothing going for us. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of us being slaves to this I'm tired oh, of it. Okay. It's all a system just training us to be in the system, to be compliant, quiet workers, keep our heads down, sit I'm at not, computer I'm or whatever. I'm not going to be quiet no more because I have mm-hmm. been in it. For, I've been in the system for 13 years. So I know how they work. I'm not going to mm-hmm. be silent anymore. Silence my ass. Because yeah. I have to liberate my generation and the children coming up in order for us to be able to be human, then I won't shut up. Mm-hmm. We need revolutionary also, guys, schools everywhere. Also, right. um, I just wanted to ask, what page are we on? 49. 49? Oh, wait, 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 49, 49, wait, 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 let me just see here. Okay, um, this is actually the end. 
This is actually where we stop. Huh. I'll get back. Right on. Good book club, y'all. That was awesome because, because, because I really wanted to know because I'm like, shit. I didn't count I didn't count the pages. <laughs> so <laughs> I was So I was worried that that that, that we didn't reach our, our page yet or, or if we skipped it, but no, t- thankfully thankfully we're we're done with it. I just wanted to I just want to to check, but y'all y'all can continue talking. I mean, about yeah. that. I mean, yeah. I mean, this is I mean, this is what we have been um saying for years, especially when they um when Colonel Pro wanted to separate Chicanos from African people, especially here in Chicago, because um Little Village has its name because the native Chicanos that that were assimilating didn't want didn't want anything to do with with African people in North Lawndale. Little Village is actually South Lawndale. All of that is Lawndale, but they wanted to create that class boundary physically, and so that's where Little Village got its name because they wanted to separate Chicanos from African people and Africans from Chicanos and create that. Uh, racist divide within within our, within each other, and some of us still think that you know Chicanos are the problem. You know they never respected us. Okay, that may be true on the surface, but if you really look at the history, that is not their fault. It's not their fault. It's the people that wanted to make nice with the with our common oppressor in order to move up. The same thing that they did to the Irish people here is the same thing that they did to uh, Chicanos, making them American, making them Mexican American, making them associate with two settler states instead of their ancestral identity, you know? And the same thing with Africans too. They've made us into into Black, um, African, American, and you have the reactionary side of us, um, the American descendants of slavery, the Solons, the foundational Black Americans, and they aid in it, especially with the uh, migrant crisis here. Um, the reactionary uh, Black Petty Boule literally wanting to make 10 cities for these migrants, even though we have more um, vacant housing units than we can even count on our fingers, okay? and our toes. They want to create that divide. They've been doing that for 50 years, you guys. It did not come from the community. It came from the people that wanted to make nice. It all comes back to fields, like division in the fields, so people don't unite division on the plantations, like yeah. house slaves versus field slaves. Right. Um, that way, and keeping the language, the common language, uh, or keeping their native language banned. That way they can communicate. Right. And keeping our native languages banned. That's how AAVE and the Tut language and other um, other languages within African people here, that's how they were formed because we were not allowed to speak our, our native Ibo tongue. We were not allowed to speak our native um, Yoruba tongue our Ijal tongue, our Congo tongue. And so in secrecy, we were able to keep it alive in the form of AAVE, in the form of the Gula language, in the form of the Tut language and other languages that we have made, including Haitian Creole, uh, Jamaican Patois, because you can hear our native African tongues in those languages that we've been able to keep alive. So once again, you know, this is this is the thing that they create. And especially with the house African and the field African uh, uh, dynamic that they created, that's how that's that's the stepping stones of colorism, actually. Because they had the lighter skinned Africans. Uh, including those now of European blood in 
uh, the house of the human trafficker and they had the darker skinned Africans working in the fields, um, being fed cocaine to stay up, you know, for long hours to uh, extract as, as much cotton as they could because that was the whole point. It's, it, it goes beyond just um, our skin color alone because especially because racialism plays a big role in colorism. And depending on how so-called ambiguous and how so-called ambiguous you are, you know, they create those divides against the so-called unambiguous and the so-called ambiguous to extract whatever kind of um, social economic relations they could out of us. And they did the same thing to Chicanos. To, to your ancestors, you know, that those that tribal politic, those tribal politics, and the same thing that happened to our ancestors back home in Africa, in al Kebulan, okay? Um, the tribalism um, on my homeland, that's how the Wawanan genocide happened. That is how King Leopold happened. That is how all those things happened and still happening. Arma Afa is still happening. The Nakba is still happening and the genocide against Chicanos is still happening. It did not end. It just became more sophisticated. The genocide against um, uh, uh, Boricuas, who are still very much here, that there's still, is still happening to us. And so it's very important that we confront those tribal politics and the colorism that affects, that affects us because it all works the same way. They just make it seem like, you know, Chicanos have overall a more uh, higher uh, step in the social ladder than Africans. And that's not the case because if you look at history, Chicanos and Filipinos work together and they still do. And, um, you know, the Brown Berets and the Black Panthers, they still do a lot of great work together. So, they hide that history and create those class divides in order for us to make nice and to embrace realities that uh, embrace identities that have been forced on us through genocide. And this is what we have to confront. If we want this to be over, then we have to confront it, especially with Zoomer children and uh, Alpha children. We have to confront it with us, with my generation and the children coming up so that the cycle can end, so that they know who they are, so that the cycle does not repeat itself because it's already been repeating for years and it needs to stop. Hey, everyone, I'm about to leave. Have a good one. Appreciate all the conversation, all the points given. All power come, my bro. Peace. All power, comrade. Well, it was, it was nice having you here. And once again, all power to the people. Much That's love. Sure. Much love, peace. But yeah. Wait, someone else left. I think, or am I, or am I, or am I just imagining things? Oh, yeah, right, Sean. Sure. Yeah, Sean yeah. left. Oh, sure. yeah. Obviously, you. Yeah. But yeah, that that's what capitalism does. It causes those divide. It teaches each colonized person a, a different a, a different whitewash bullshit history in, in order to divide those groups. In order to make it seem like there is never any form of unity between anyone. To make them hate the, themselves and other. Teaching them racist, white supremacist stereotypes. Um, of Chicano people, of Boricua people, African people, of African people, and so on and so forth to divide them. Right. And with, and with Af Ashkenazi Jewish people, um, Ita uh, um, Italians, um, Irish people, they were assimilated and tricked into thinking that they were quote unquote white, that right. they, that, um, that, um, that, um, that they were American to, to, um, and accepted, um, and, ex and and were given white privilege within the racial hierarchy in order to widen that divide even closer. 
by emboldening these white supremacist groups among Irish, among Jewish people, and so on and so forth, to cause that that division, teaching racist history in school, whitewash history in school, funding white supremacist Italian and Irish gangs, funding them and giving them positions in government, and so on and so forth. These are the shit that that they do. They trick people into thinking that there that there is this natural divide of race. What's well, bullshit? Because that because the idea came that idea came from us first, and it, it, it became more sophisticated. And keep in mind, African Chicanos exist. So it's that yep. it's that it's also that double edged sword of um of anti African. Um, oppression against Chicanos of African heritage and um, Afro-Chicanos have contributed a lot to Chicano history as well that is not talked about because once again that Latinidad that mestizaje, that homogenization of that that not being Hispanic enough quote unquote right like like I literally had and it is the wildest shit ever I literally had someone come up to me and say you're not his. You're not white. You're Hispanic. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> that makes no fucking sense. What? Like, I don't understand that shit, bro. Yeah, but but that's it's how the they wildest work. fucking shit ever. Right. It's it's that. I mean, that's literally how they work. I mean, I mean, these concepts don't even have any kind of scientific reality to it. But that's the whole point. It's a class it's economic. It's social. It's a class thing. It's a class thing. That's the difference. See, that's the difference with that. A lot of people think that when we say that, then we're uh, downplaying the problem. No, we're not. We're real. We're adding a class analysis to it because that's literally what it is. It's a class struggle. God damn it. Hello. So it always has been. We're adding a dialectical, a scientific, and principled analysis to it. We can't be class reductionist, people. We can't ignore any of the contradictions. They all derive from class. First came capitalism, then came racism. First came capitalism, then then came pathphobia. It all derives from the same class system. It always has. I mean, there's literally whole books on this. Fearing the Black Body, um, how the Irish (laughs) white, um, the history of white people. um, (laughs) Settlers. You can't forget settlers. (laughs) Look, look. And, and the thing about settlers, the thing about settlers is that they don't even read the book. They just they read the title. Ology is supposed to is supposed to catch your attention. That's the point. The mythology that's supposed to catch your attention because just because it says mythology does not mean it's myth. Yeah, it just means exactly. this means that there is a class condition among the European. Um, American uh, bump it proletariats. Exactly. And, you know, if anything, a, sorry, there's a history with that. And, you know, you have to read the whole book, actually read between the lines of settlers to really understand it. If you don't, if you don't, and you just base it off the title, you're going to have a misunderstanding of what the book is about because no, the book is not saying that white people are not part of the proletariat. There are white people who are a pro- who are a part of the proletariat. It's just that due to the racial hierarchy inherent within capitalism, a lot of white people are labor aristocrats. They have an extra form of privilege that colonized people don't. However, due to lumpenization, everyone is becoming more, more lumpen. Even white people are becoming lumpenized to a right. to a lesser extent. But even there are becoming lumpenized they're becoming lumpenized too because once again capitalism and decay and this is what we um have been saying that they would not be safe and that european americans americans in quote that they think that assimilating, I mean, assimilation is really just becoming a caricature. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, I mean, if you really want to know the truth, I mean, that happened with Italians, that happened with the Irish and 
you know, you see the result of that. And I actually read um, the document, uh, the documents of the Black Liberation Army, um, because um, that excerpt that I sent you about um, their criticism of the proletariat line, right? Yeah. I actually read it even further, and I got what the, what they were saying. I got what they were saying because once again, you have to really understand where their mind was at. You know, making you know their it'll you know ideological line clear um i i understand i understand it now because there's a lot of european american proletariats that are kind of reactionary um and even like don't want to have anything to do with african um african common people and so, you know, those divides are very clear. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like, don't judge a book by its cover because they're, they're not really saying that they're, that they're not proletarians because we are. What they're saying is that as long as European Americans as European American um, proletariats and uh, aristocrats continue to have um, a racist, ideology, a racist ideology within their line, then those divides will be very, very crystal clear, and African people would not be, you know, a central part of that struggle and. I think it's very, very important that we that we that that I make that clear, because especially with including uh, Chicano Lumpen proletariats, uh, they're racialized too. They're yep. racialized uh, and homogenized, and um, you know, you know that divide between you know that you know being native and so-called Mexican are two completely different things when. That's literally not the case. And being so-called Mexican is multilateral. I mean, there are, once again, there are African Chicanos. There are indigenous Chicanos, which makes up a large part of it, and Asian Chicanos. And when we don't confront the racist ideology that so uh, reverberates among the proletary, the modern proletary struggle, then African people will continue to be left out, and Chicanos will continue to be left out, and Boricuas will continue to be left out, and uh, Chinese workers and Chinese Lumpens will continue to be left out, and Japanese uh, proletarians will continue to be left out, and Vietnamese uh, and Filipino um, Lumpen proletarians will continue to be left out. If we don't, if they, if the European American working class does not confront the racist ideology that still reverberates among their own. That's what they want to make that clear. And, you know, going back to, you know, the reading today, you know, this is why we need that solidarity because we cannot, you cannot be isolated, you cannot be isolating yourself and thinking that you're making revolution. You can't, do that. It's a collective struggle. All it always has been. To work together. And no. among the colonizers, we have to betray our white privilege. That's what we have to do. That is what we, that's what we as colonizers comrades have to do. Even lumping col um, co um, colonizer people who, yes, are obviously oppressed and um, especially oppressed by um, capitalism still have to betray their white privilege. They still have to unlearn living with whiteness and struggle alongside colonized people. Find out where they- It's a united come. front. And, and, and rediscover where they come from. Exactly, and be a part of their materialistic conditions. That's what we as colonizer, that's, that's what we as colonizer revolutionaries have to do. Go into our own communities and radicalize and um and organize our people with the guidance of colonized people. Right. African power for African people 
Boricua power for Boricua people, Chicano power for Chicano people, Palestinian power for Palestinian people, and other oppressed peoples that we still need to stand in solidarity and fight alongside with. It's a united right fight. And we have to confront all the poison that we have been taught together. And even amongst mm -hmm. each other, amongst ourselves. It's not gonna be easy. It's not supposed to be easy, you guys. It's not supposed to be easy. It, 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 it'll take a lot of confronting yourself to unlearn what you may think about Chicano people, what you may think about African people, about what you, what you may think about Palestinians, what you may think about Irish people, what you may think about Basque people, what you may think about uh, indigenous Jewish people, about indigenous people in Africa, because indigenous people make up the vast majority of our homeland anyway, outside of the settlers. So, like we have to confront it together and amongst each other. Really confront it. Really, really confront it. Because this is a process and we have to be sure that it can keep going forward and not stay in one place. We cannot stay in one place for three years and thinking that we're making progress. We have to um, decolonize on top of organizing, actually organizing. We have to criticize ourselves and each other. And everything around us. And go against that bourgeois grain of thought and sentiment and apply a scientific and dialectical <laughs> and principled analysis on right. ourselves. And while we have these thoughts and why we believe what, 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 we, what we believe and how to unlearn that and relearn it, it and that includes watching what we hear because regardless of what you think you have said before asking it again even if you didn't notice it your brain did your brain is like a sponge it absorbs everything around it and regardless of what and regardless of what you may think or believe everything has an influence on you from your what you hear your to what you do to what you listen to everything influences you and if you are not catching yourself and what you watch, and what you hear, and who you engage with, that bourgeois thought, consciously or subconsciously, is going to start affecting you. Your thoughts, your beliefs, right. your behavior, right. your actions. And we live in a campus society 24-7. So therefore, by that logic, we have to engage in self-criticism 24-7. We All have to watch time. what we watch and say 24-7. All the time. Because all the time, have... because if we because if we let ourselves slip, that will lead. If we let ourselves slip, if we don't watch or if we don't criticize and self criticize the world around us and ourselves, and especially if we don't engage in practice, because as as Fred Hampton said, theory is cool, but theory without practice ain't shit. If we don't engage in practice and organize and agitate we don't and serve educate the and elevate. If we don't serve the people, then we will never gain conceptual knowledge. And we will we'll never, never gain conceptual knowledge of why things are the way they are. As right. long as we as as long as we are engaging in praxis, then we are then, then we are constantly getting rid of that bourgeois thought. Slowly but, but surely. We're constantly, we're constantly getting rid of it. And the thing is your mouth can lie, but your mind can't. Exactly. Your mouth can lie, but your mind and your brain can't. And it's very, very important. That and hell, we, it, happen, it happens to the best of us. Even principled, <clears throat> even principled people slip up. Even they make mistakes. Being principled <clears throat> does not make you perfect. We're human. And when we allow ourselves to be human, catching ourselves... We will make more headway than we think. And we have to unlearn that racist ideology amongst, amongst everyone. How we may feel about each other. You know, Chicanos unlearning racist ideology 
that they may believe about African people and including Chicanos of African uh, heritage, you know, Africans amongst other African people because it's the matter of racialism. The determination of our traits and capacity based on what we look like, based on how ambiguous or so-called unambiguous and ambiguous we are, how light or dark we are. And this is a problem that has been persistent amongst African and Chicano people for, for half a century now, because this is, this is half a century since Combs for Pro came out swinging. So it's a lot of work, not only amongst African people, but among Chicanos as well. And everyone, everyone involved. Confronting the Latina dad, that Mr. Zahed, the anti-African racism. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work because once again, they make it believable enough for you to fall for it. You become a part of the problem. And exactly. We have to really confront it, really unlearn it, really, really, really unlearn it together because it's, it's a double-edged sword. Well, a, a triple S sword, really, because of the class um, divides involved. So it's very, very important for African people to unlearn racist ideology against Chicano people and for Chicano people to unlearn racist ideology against African people. Because there are um, uh, Chicanos that do have um, some distant African uh, ancestry, but they don't know that because once again, it's about homogenization. And so um, confronting that class divide too, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of work. But as Thomas and Carl said, we cannot be tired of explaining. We have to keep explaining. With it's our any, duty. It's our duty. You don't get the right to not explain to anyone. You don't get to isolate yourself and think that you're making progress. No, you don't get that right. Because in order for African women to be free, we have to confront the misogynoir that affects African women and other uh, gender expansive Africans because uh, there we still have a femicide amongst our amongst our girls and amongst our women in our community. And when we, do, when we leave African women, when we leave African girls, when we leave uh, other um, gender expansive Africans out, we, per, we continue the problem. We continue our femicide continue our genocide. We continue um, the racialized misogyny. We continue the adultification. We continue the microaggressions. We continue the policing. We continue it. If we don't confront it, and if we really don't stay with our feet on the ground, struggling forward with that, then it will continue. It will continue. And we are at war with our common It's oppressors. a class war, God damn it! It's a class war. It's a class war. It's not, Af it's not Chicanos versus Africans. No, 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 it's no. Not it's not a race war. It's not a gender war. It's not. Uh, it's not a. It's not a cishet war. It is a class war. It's a class also. War. Also, I just wanted to um, ask to not leave our fellow comrades out, comrade Johnny Torres and comrade 
um, Yesenia, what are your thoughts on everything that that they were speaking on? I don't want to leave y'all out. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear y'all too. Oh, am I John? Um, you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah, I do believe it's a it's a class struggle, and we're the ones who have to uh, do something about it. You know, it's, a, it's up to us to keep the movement alive by doing the things that we do right now. If it's not, you know, outside there, uh, protesting is doing things like this and understanding uh, the issues and addressing them. So, <clears throat> so it's very important to do what we do, and. Uh, Definitely uh, other projects that have to do with this, have to do with newspapers, uh, publishing books, or uh, doing other things that definitely uh, brings attention to these issues. Uh, so we are doing something about it. And that's good. You know, we should all feel good about that, that we are one of those people who do something because there's a lot of people out there who don't do nothing. And they say they're about uh, the revolution, but Wait. they don't do nothing. They complain. Yeah, exactly. They complain about it, but there's no action, you know. You're so it's like, it, <laughs> at, at least we're willing to do more than uh, talk about it. We're willing to do stuff and you know to uh, address it as well. So I think that's that's good. Right on. Yes, and I also think that um, I feel like the disconnect is between parents and their kids like for oh, yeah. at least for my my experience growing up um it was hard to relate with my parents because they grew up in Mexico and me being born here I was very privileged um and they're like you have everything what are you complaining about what are you um you know what struggles do you have like you have free school you have um access to all of this um you didn't have to grow up like we did and it's interesting to see how different um experiences are for people who have been i guess considered what you would consider here for multiple generations here in the united states for multiple generations as right. to what i would be labeled as a first generation even though we've been here four generations yeah if that makes sense. <laughs> um but that's another divide, and uh, it's interesting to see how even within our communities, we get divided by gangs, we get divided by what we decide to represent, what side of the tracks we grew up on, uh, what schools we went to, or f like associations and ties to families, and you, um, we have to consider all of that, but that's all just smaller parts of a bigger system trying to keep us fighting each other and it's easier what I've been taught it's easier for us to kill someone that looks like someone who's who's one of us than someone who looks different than us um which I thought was interesting um so maybe that's why we have so many uh internal like race wars and community wars um right. but the statistics is that indigenous women get raped and murdered more by, by white males because the system plays in the favor. They can't be convicted. They can't do anything once they go off the reservation or anything like that. And because of lack of resources, they get away with it. Right. Um, and then it's just constant division and everything that, that we can possibly ever divide. And, the capitalist system if there isn't a need create a need or conditions where people need it so you can profit if yeah. you can like people are selling air oxygen that's crazy yeah yeah like oxygen bars and stuff um and so and it's already a privilege to be able to have grass like when i lived in california I was like, wow, where, where's the grass? Where can I like sit in the grass and just enjoy that connection? And then when I would find grass, I would get an allergic reaction. I'm like, this isn't like Colorado. Um, so even when you move, it 
it's it's a different experience and it's still the same similar struggles just on a different scale right um but that's what i loved about california was seeing so many people gathered together to march to protest to unite to make a difference um and that's what i'm trying to to continue to do here in colorado and do my part i may not be able to force people to attend or whatever it may be but i can provide that that space that opportunity um and that's that's what we can all do and to further educate myself and pass down that knowledge right exactly and and you know especially oh sorry especially in, in our especially in our current generation something that's very important that i think we all understand is to try and incorporate the stable of people it's the revolution you know because once again the tools of liberate as technology advances and as we continue to move further and further the tools that we can use for liberation widen we have what, so many things that we can do at our disposal that, that the Bolsheviks didn't have or that the PRC didn't have or that um right. or that or that the or that the Vietnamese in the Viet in the Vietnamese Revolution didn't have. There are many ways that you could be a revolutionary. Once again, being a revolutionary does not mean going out with guns and shooting people. No, that's not what it means to be a revolutionary. Being a revolutionary doesn't mean to carry guns and being strapped on and just, and just, and just showing off. Being a revolutionary means loving the people and showing them that you love them. That's what it means to be a revolutionary. Being a revolutionary means problem solving. Problem solving societal, economic, um, cultural, and political problems within your community. Meet the masses where they're at. Show them they give a fuck about them. Be like Huey P. Newton and uh, and Bobby Seal. They started off just the two of them, but they showed the masses. They showed the new African community that they give a that they give a fuck about right. them. And because after that, after that, people started engaging in them. They started following them. They started hearing what they had to say because they because, because Huey P. Newton gained the respect of the masses. Children, he earned especially, their respect, especially the children, as oh, we yeah. read, and the uh, and the mothers, the mothers and the children, because the women and the children are the bearers of revolution, and so they continue that, it on. That deep admiration that Huey had for those kids was just insurmountable, you know, and. It's very, very um, important that we have that, especially for disabled uh, people, because the main people that know how to use social media successfully to mobilize uh, others are disabled people, disabled people, mm -hmm. immuno, um, immunocompromised people, um, uh, people with uh, mental health issues, um, immunocompromised people, uh, COVID conscious disabled people, they are the main ones that know how to use social media to mobilize other disabled, uh, immunocompromised COVID conscious people. And they've been oppressed by it. They, they, yeah. they know how to, how to deal with that oppression because they experience it on a daily basis, especially, <laughs> especially colonized disabled people especially especially them and there's actually uh a zoom hangout that they do about every week or every two weeks or i think about every month uh i think it's called still coviding which is like a zoom hangout for disabled immunocompromised people um you know that's cool i want to join that yeah they actually have that um they talk up, they have different breakout rooms for different people. And, you know, they have different breakout rooms for different topics and, you know, all, you know, all this other stuff. And that is how you use technology and social media to agitate the disabled masses and, and educate them and elevate them and radicalize them. And they we, know how to do 
it. They know how to do it very, very well. We know how to do it very, very well. And, you know, that's, that's the special thing that as long as you know how, how to be creative with it, you can make headway. And the you same, can. we know how to make headway with that. And it's very important that disabled people uh, be at the forefront because it's that double-edged sword that we face. And so, you know, the fact that there's uh, a hangout, you know, for COVID conscious people on Zoom, you know, is very, very important. Very, very important because, you know, we can't be outside, you know, you know COVID is still here. And, you know, there are some that cannot, gen that genuinely cannot be outside because their bodies are compromised. And, you know, once again, there's no such thing as health under capitalism. So, you know, the fact that we have a hangout, a Zoom hangout for disabled people, especially for that, is very, very important. Very important, because once again, even if you never touch a gun, even if you never carry a gun, as yeah. long as you are radicalizing the masses, as long as you're educating them, as long as you are, as long as you're providing, um, um, as long as you provide survival programs to them, as long as you are, as long as you are making them see why things are the way they are. Whether, whether that be through survival programs, whether that be through online propaganda, whether that, that be through um, through art, music, literature, regardless of what you're doing, if you are putting revolution in the mind of the people, you're a revolutionary. Yep. And that's the thing that we need to do and also make it accessible for us. Exactly. Because because there are some disabled people who can't go outside, like you said. There are some that can't carry firearms on them for whatever reason. But they can still be revolutionaries. They can still be in the struggle. Like like I mean I mean, what do we need to pick up a gun for? What do we need to pick up a gun for? Only because for self defense. Only for self defense. Only in the extremity of, you know, like actual self-defense. But, you know, most of the time we don't need a firearm necessarily because all we, because all we need is to speak our mind and to exactly. agitate and agitate. You know, we don't, we, we don't want to, you know, uh, bomb buildings. We don't want to do that. You know, do fuck we want the underground? To... Um, fuck, uh, um, um, fuck the weather underground. No weather right. underground bullshit. Like we don't, we don't, we don't want to be shooting anybody. We don't want to be doing that because we're better than that. But we will speak our mind. We will speak our mind. And either and... way, either way, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to shoot a single cop because the moment. The masses realize the moment the masses become con class conscious, and the moment that they realize they don't need the oppressor, the um their oppressors, the, their oppressor will come to try and get them back in line. The bourgeois will reveal will will reveal for themselves where they lie. They'll show the masses that they're not on their side. Like what happened, for example, after Huey P. Newton was giving out that free breakfast program and the Black Panther Party, UP doing the Black Panther Party was giving out that free breakfast program to, to the children of the mothers who, who whose children could, couldn't, couldn't eat for weeks. The cops came to try and tear down that, that program down. And once they tried it, and once they, they came... Same thing and once, Chicago. Exactly. And once they came... And try to tear down that program down. Once they showed that they didn't give a fuck about the mothers or their children, the masses already knew. Just by observing what they were doing, they already knew who, who, um, who, who, who were their enemy. They already knew who were on their side. 
the Black Panther probably didn't have to shoot a single fucking cop. Because the moment the bourgeois feel like they, like their privilege is threatened, they, they they go to fascism. They go to force. And when they go to force, they show which side they're on. They show their true colors. Right. Right. That's the same thing that happened here. And even, like I said before, one of the um, one of the people in the Red Guard here with the Chicago Police Department, they were in a daily operation, you know, to suppress their breakfast program. And the, the, the bourgeoisie's tools came in and literally took all the eggs out, all the milk out, all of the food that they have for the kids. For African kids. And he left. He quit. He quit the whole thing when he saw what it was actually about. I mean, if it has to come to that in order for you to see your real enemy, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you leave the bourgeois to their own devices and eventually they'll show their true colors. Every single time the bourgeois try and uphold their oppression over the masses, they shoot, they shoot themselves in the leg. Yeah. Yeah. They reveal more and more who is on, um, which side are they actually on. All it took was them trying to stop that, that breakfast program for those mothers and those children to already know who was on their side, who actually cared about them. It wasn't the fascist pigs. It wasn't it was, the capitalists. It, was it wasn't these comprador. It, it wasn't these compradors who was telling them to go and vote. It was the Black Panther Party. Right. It was it was the people in the community. Uh, it was warfare against African children. It was mm -hmm. warfare. African children, and it's still happening to this day when they committed um, classism against us, putting out, putting us out to be these gangbangers and these hooligans and all this stuff, and literally making every single grown ass adult turn against us, regardless. And you know, it's um, James Jackie Sales, who is from here. Um, who's part of the new African independence movement, um, his meditations book on friends for non spiritual of the earth, he goes into that. He goes into um, the narrative that they put out about African lumpen children and having adults turn against us for the youth back then. And once again, you know, even even on the cultural side, they they despise hip hop for being so uh, drug infested, promoting violence, promote, uh, promoting warfare, but they don't actually look at how hip hop actually came to be and why hip hop is like that. Now, because hip hop came from African and Caribbean lumping youth in the Bronx. Okay, that's the truth. Let's get that fucking straight again, okay? Hip hop came from African and Caribbean lumpen children and youth. Once it was stolen by the capitalists, then they made it their mission to influence warfare and violence amongst us. Because that was the whole point. That was the whole point. This was all in the height of the Reagan era, so it was it was even worse under him. I mean, we know that. I mean, they made they made Chicanos into Mexican Americans and literally lose a sense of who they are. So you know that it was it was all terrible under Reagan, and once again the breakfast program. If they have that much smack about African children. 
then you know who is truly for us. Exactly. Because exactly. Afri because African youth are it, it, we're a whole class of our own, especially lumping African youth and children, especially here in Chicago when we go downtown <laughs> every single freaking weekend and we tear down downtown and all these growing asses still call for us to be controlled and all this stuff because we are showing them who our real enemy is. And they don't see that. They don't not see even that. children are safe. Not, not even children. Ch children are not safe. Children Look not what safe. they did to little Bobby Hudson. They killed them without That's a second thought, cool. without remorse. They killed them 17, without a single care in the world. Seventeen years old, Jonathan Jackson, um, George Jackson's little brother, seventeen years old. But where the problem? The youth is not safe. No one is safe. Right. You, and we've been safe for 50 years and y'all didn't want to listen to us. Even as a fetus, you're not safe. Even as a clump of cells, we're not safe because we're scapegoats for capitalists to control um, people who we're can be able of reproductive health, of reproductive care. And they gender it to ensure that, you know, they can be able to have control and dominance over our bodies, include, especially uh, colonized people with the capacity to conceive because you can, be, you can be a trans woman and be able to conceive um, a child without a transplant. Like, because once again, sex does not exist. It only exists under feudalism and capitalism. Mm -hmm. You can't have that because we didn't operate that way. And we never had those identities. We were exactly. always, our ancestors were always gender fluid. We had so-called um, uh, female husbands uh, and male wives. We always operated that way. That was the people and the land. That was our relationship to our earth, from our earth, from this earth not this man, woman, male, female bullshit because male and female were introduced to us. It was introduced to us. Those are not actual markers. Those are class markers, okay? Mm -hmm. Those are class markers because once again, this is why we need these programs because they don't know what the fuck they're thinking and they don't know what the hell they're saying and they don't know how to read a damn thing and they don't know First came capitalism, then Bio came the idea of gender as a binary. Cis heteronormativity and all that stuff, you know? It came from capitalism. It comes from the same system. It is, may, some is, of these contradictions, some of these contradictions and class antagonisms may predate capitalism, but capitalism continues to let them live and fester and become right. global phenomenon. But they're talking about gender ideology. Is this heteronormativity not ide not gender ideology? Is um, gendering us based on if we have a uh, dick or pussy or not? Um, is that not gender ideology? Is um, introducing uh, boys to uh, little boys to sexual violence? Is that not gender ideology? Is that not that? Is that not gender ideology? Is that not bourgeois ideology? But you have so much smack for us because you've been brainwashed. You have been brainwashed to think that, you know, that, that you have to be much, that, that, that you have to be a macho man, that you have to be, you know, hyper feminine, you know, a hyper feminine woman, that you have to be these things. And even because hyperfemininity is a secondary to yep. hyper masculinity and toxic femininity does exist. Toxic femininity. In this example, 
not on a systemic level, mind you. It's not as if it's on a systemic level, but it does exist on a social level due to toxic masculinity and the patriarchy. Right. And, you know, you have some women that assimilate with being with the boys, being with the men, being with uh, the, uh, the misogynists. And, you know, it's... it's and that- internalized misogyny, yeah. Internalized misogyny. Thank you very much. Internalized misogyny. That's, I mean, you see it. You see it. And, you know, it's very important that we confront secondary contradictions within secondary contradictions, within secondary contradictions, because they're all primary and secondary within each other. And they, it, it, it's overlap. They overlap. It overlaps. And that example, in that example, toxic masculinity and the misogynistic patriarchy is the primary contradiction, and toxic femininity is a secondary contradiction. They overlap. Right. They overlap with each other, and um, we have to really, you know, confront it because, you know, gender-conforming people or so-called cis people, where are you know they're arbitrarily fixed to conform to the bourgeois ideology of gender. And when we add that class consciousness to it, then we make more headway because people think, you know, the mainstream definition is that, you know, uh, you're assigned uh, gender at birth. And that's not quite the case because these are class markers. So these would, it would not make sense to have your assigned gender class marker stay in one place you know and once again gender does not stay in one place exactly. Our body and your stays- genitalia does not determine your gender identity it is not determined gender identity because once again there, it's just genitalia that's it that's it exactly that's it. It you know matter is that it, is that determine anything about who you're attracted to how you personally want to express Yourself, how what you personally define what is what is feminine and masculine to yourself, and so on and so forth. It says nothing about you. It's all superficial perception. It's it's it's, it's, a, it's, a class, it's all exactly. It's a class marker, and you know it's all perceptual it's, and not conceptual. It's it's this is what we have to um, confront uh, within our people too, the abolishing of the bourgeois construct and ideologies of gender and come back to being an actually boldly gender fluid people to be human again, you know? And, you know, if, you know, our bodies does not stay in one place, why do you think, I mean, why do you think that, you know, our bones grow, you know? Why do you think our skeletons grow as we age? You know, so, like, I mean, come on. I mean, you can put two and two together here. Everything goes through stages. Everything in life. Everything is constantly changing, adapting, moving forward. Nothing stays the same. Our bodies constantly (laughs) grow. Our minds, literally, our, our minds, literally, on a physical level, every time we sleep once per week, our, our mind literally reboots itself. Yeah. Like, I mean, how do you think flowers grow? <laughs> there's something static about existence. If if everything was static, existence wouldn't exist. <laughs> like everything, everything be- is constantly moving forward. Nothing is ever the same. If Nothing. It if it wasn't for struggle, we would not be here. So it would exactly. be a place, not struggle. Without revolution, there is no human civilization. There is no societies. There's nothing. If revolution didn't exist, we as a species would have died. A long time ago. <laughs> a long it's time because ago. of revolution that we're still even here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, you know, they it's it's so funny because these people say, you know, they want to ban all the books in these slave factories that we call schools, that we call colleges and dictate what's best for us. We know what's best for us. We're children, we know what's best for us. We we know who we are. We know who we are. (laughs) 
We know who we are. And we keep we allowing depend on who we are. Control to control our livelihood. And you know, you know, they wonder why we act out so bad. <laughs> that you know, they wonder why we are we disobey them all the time, right? They wonder why. Because, because the slave factory is not built for the human. It's built for the disobedient. The machine. For the disobedient. For the obedient. Obedient. Yeah. Obedient. And it's not it's not built to it's not it's not built to um to allow us to be human. It's built to make us machines. It's built to make it's built to, to sap the life out of us and literally prepare us to have nine to five minimum wage jobs. I mean it's that's really it. A, I mean just look at your class schedules. <laughs> it's a factory. It's really a factory look job your, schedule. Look at your class schedules from when you were going up in the slave factories now. Think about what you had. Think about how long the school day was. And tell me that is not capitalism right there. Wait, like, please explain that to me. Like seven o'clock to two, three o'clock. Come on. Come on. Come on. Really. Really? Like it's the exact, it's basically the exact same format. It dictates what when you um when you wake up what you wear when you go um when you when you, when you go to school what classes you go to when you can take a break when you can go to to the bathroom who who you can talk to what um what you're told phones are to, not uh, to do when you right. sleep it will really dictate everything just like it, a job especially the phones as uh, and speaking and speaking of which children have a fucking right to be on their phones okay because exactly. when, you, we have we have children with ADHD. We have people that that need phones in order to you know keep function us, better, a, a function better, and they want to blame phones as the problem. No, the fact of the matter is y'all y'all are eugenists and y'all are bums and y'all can't even uh, educate us with uh, with um, neurodivergence in mind and How actual about correct information. <laughs> How about that? Since y'all want to have so much smack about us being on our phones, um, because once again, we have a right to be on our fucking phones, no matter if you like it or not. I don't care how I don't give a damn how older you are. Okay. I don't give a damn. Okay. We have a right to be on our phones. We have a right to um do what keeps us occupied because we don't want to be conforming to being fixed. There's no such thing as a standard brain, you guys. That's eugenics bullshit. <laughs> there is no such thing as a static state of being. It does not exist. Everything is moving. Even if something looks motionless, it's moving. It's, it's moving in it's, some way, shape, or form. I, I mean, I mean, how do you think we move? How do you think our arms move? <laughs> like, come on! Also, also, I just want to ask, um, Comrade um, Johnny Torres and Comrade um, Yesenia, um, I would love to hear y'all's um, thoughts on this and um, and on gender fluidity, especially when it comes, uh, especially when it comes to, right, yes, if, I remember, if I remember correctly, the term is two-spirited, correct? Yeah, two-spirit, yeah. I would love to hear y'all some um, thoughts on that. If, if it's okay for free or I'll say something about it. Yeah, and there's and there's and before that, there's actually also um gender fluid identities uh oh. with with indigenous uh communities on the so-called Mexican side. I think uh uh Muxi, I think so uh, Muxi, I think that's how you say that. Probably. Yeah. Um, um, hi. Uh, so for me, growing up, I was strictly taught just male, female. Um, they definitely push, try to push the dresses on me, uh, the pink, you know, don't like blue because that's for boys and everything. But for 
Um, it wasn't until I got into the university, actually, where I heard about the term two-spirit. Um, and I was like, what, what does that mean? What is, like, what does that entail? Like, um, and so it was a term used for, uh, that was sacred used for people who were highly regarded in the community that bridged that gap between the male and the woman, um, that were able to connect, connect the communities, connect with the spirits, um, and hold a sacred place when it came to bringing everyone together and doing um, both those tax tasks that were traditionally male or female. Um, and so I also learned that that was the first time I ever, I guess, saw indigeneity in the, like in the LGBT movement um, being represented and it was refreshing it was it was something new it was something that um, definitely helped decolonize what we've been taught on there's only two genders um, there's only two sexes but we're a part of nature we're not above nature we're not you know below nature we're a part of it we're integrated and as many different shades as we are, as many different people we are, personalities, we're all human. And we should be able to freely express ourselves in whatever way that we want, whatever way we're comfortable. Um, we shouldn't have to conform to whatever society, whatever, whatever time period um, that we are born into, to those standards. And that's right all I have. Right on. Right on. Now it's beautiful. And yeah, we shouldn't conform to what society dictates what is or isn't a quote unquote man or what is or isn't a quote unquote woman. Because once again, even among class societies, gender roles um, are always changing. What was considered masculine or feminine um, um, a century ago is not considered feminine. It all changes. It, it's never, it's never the same. It's never the same. Heels were originally seen as a masculine thing, with it originating from the Persians, if I if I remember correctly. Um, boys in boys in the um, the 1600s in Britain, little boys were um, were dressed with breeches which is a type of skirt, and that was seen as masculine for the time. What's considered masculine or feminine always changes. It's never the same. So this idea that, that, that being a man is static and that, and, and that being a man means this, 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 and this, it's all bullshit. It's all fucking bullshit. Men can express themselves in whatever way they want, and, whatever, and they can have whatever, and their identity is not linked to whatever their genitalia is, but um, but um, but um, but um, but 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 instead try to understand themselves and how they personally feel and identify with. Right. That's what it means. So fuck these bourgeois labels of what of. Of, of what your correct quote unquote gender is. There is no such thing as a correct or um or um or standard gender. That's it's, a, f- okay, it's, it's always been a binary. It is always a binary. Mike, there's no such thing as as sex either, because that came out of capitalism as well, the concept of sex. Mm-hmm. And conflating sex with gender so that um, those secondary I guess you would say the secondary contradictions of capitalism too, right? I'd say so, yeah, because sex um, because once again, sex is only is is limited um, by perceptual (laughs) knowledge of what your eyes see. Instead, it's 
instead of going at, at the essence of something, of why things are the way they are. So, yeah, sex, um, if I remember correctly, sex is a bourgeois concept. Yeah. It's a and, class dynamic. And speaking of which, there's actually an amazing book on the history of the concept of the bourgeois concept of sex, which I'll put in the chat for you guys. And I think Ooh. you can, I think you can, I think I told you about it, the Making Sex book, right? I think so. Yeah, that's the book. Um, I'm gonna put, um, and it actually came out in 1992. So, this has already been now for four years. <laughs> right on. Put it in the chat. Did you already put it? It's in here. Yeah, I put it in. Sorry, what? I put it in. Right on. I see it now. Hell yeah. Yeah. It, um, it, like, it literally goes into the making and unmaking of sex over the centuries. It, it, like, it, like, it literally talks about um, the story of sex in the Western world um, from the ancient times to the modern times. Like, and the fact that this was made, that this was published in 1992 is kind of a real big testament for the time. I'm definitely going to read this later. Thank you so much, Shanti. You're awesome. <laughs> I, look, if y'all need book recommendations, I'm your girl. I'm your girl. Okay? Right on. Right yes. on. Definitely uh, uh, interesting to check out. You're going what? Sorry? I said Thank you for yes, thank you for sharing. It's definitely going to be interesting to check out just the evolution of it because it right always on. everything always. Yep, everything is always changing. Um, with that being said, does anyone have anything to add whatsoever about the book or about what we were just or, or about what we were just recently discussing? Anyone? If no one has anything else to add, then this is most likely where we're going to stop. It was a pleasure um, talking to all, to all of y'all. Thank you so much for everyone that came here, and thank you for everyone who um, who will watch this, if anyone does. I and hope y'all have an amazing day, and all, and all, and all love, and, and all power and love, all revolutionary l love and power. And, and important to mention, um, happy anniversary to the Black Panther Party today. The, the, oh, we love you. We the, love you. Um, um, what, what anniversary is it again, Shanti? The 57th anniversary. The 57th anniversary of the Black Panther Party of self-defense. Of self -defense. Defense. The happy original. birthday. Happy birthday to the revolutionaries who gave their lives for the struggle. To Bobby Huey Seale. Newton, to Bobby Seale. To Huey P. Newton. To Lil Bobby Hutton. To. To. Um, to. Um, who else? To Emory Douglas. To Emory Douglas. To, 
a badass to, to all the people to, that are uh, to all the people to that are to a status exactly. four from Wilmington Everyone North made possible. from like I'm telling y'all if it wasn't for the South there would be no Black Panther Party because Huey P. Newton from Monroe, Louisiana um, Bobby Seale from Dallas, Texas Asada Shakur from Wilmington, North Carolina and all the people that have made it possible that come from the Deep South there would be no Black Panther Party without the South. Right on. And there would be no Panther if it wasn't for the South because they used that same Panther that was used in the civil rights uh, movement for the Black for the Black Panther Party for self-defense. So we give credit to the South here as well. Exactly. To every revolutionary that has come up and engage in a class struggle, whether it be from the north, south, east, west, the struggle lives on because of y'all. And we'll continue the struggle by learning from those who um, who have passed away, learn what they got right, what they got wrong, what's applicable, what isn't, and what can we add to our current materialistic conditions and move class struggle forward to liberation and freedom for all humanity. And for yep. the future generations. Yes, for all humanity, all power to the people. Beautiful discussion. And all, and all power to the people. People, comrade. It was a beautiful yep. discussion. Johnny Torres, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Right on, Johnny Torres. Do you want do, do you want to say something to send us off? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, power to the people. Viva la causa. And uh, I'll see everyone tomorrow for the next uh, book reading. Right on. Right. Viva, viva la revolution. All power to the people. See you the time.